Yeah, so Kenya and uh, not Kenya, Karen, I the miss our first guest speaker. Are there any questions that they wanted to ask? There is a few questions, but I don't think my phone would allow me to ask it. I'm like just a few seconds from cutting off. Oh, uh, okay. Well, when you are you going to your, going home before you judge? No, no, no. Judge is five. Well, it starts at five thirty. Hopefully, we finish by by six thirty today. Oh, uh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Let's jump back in when. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the idea? Ask us the questions then. Um, but it was cool. I listened to the entire recording. I mean, knowledgeable, real yeah. life experiences. You know, that's 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 the way to go. Yep. The people who have been there and done that. Yep. Yep. Our experiences are just great. I mean, not like they're greater than yours. I mean, we get some more real life examples from you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everybody's looking for good grades in our brand. Everybody trying to avoid the G or <laughs> uh, uh, but I don't really record it. When I listened to the recording, it was pretty, pretty good. I mean, um, no, I was I was impressed. Well, I mean, so I guess I'd be impressed because I mean I mean I would not have chosen it, but I think she was wrong. Oh, okay. Okay. I don't know if anybody has anybody has had Questions that I thought of after after the class. Mama. Good afternoon, everybody. Hey, hey. We had any questions? What is mic is on? Um. Karen is probably your mic still on. Sorry, no problem. Yeah, so anybody have any questions before we? Hello, Bonnie. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Sorry about that music. No, 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 I can't get a question. Okay. Okay, okay you still short of a few people. Um, the only person I know should be missing today is Karen. Um, and then we'll start, I'll start with note six. I really want to um, I really want to go through some of note six before we have the second guest speaker guest okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, two. any of the people who were quiet on Tuesday had any, have anything to say now Ms. Batiste was that, uh, was, was, was that the person who distracted you a long time before? I miss that. <laughs> I'm asking if that's a person who distracted you. <laughs> who? Um, Miss Lazarus? Uh -huh. I, already met, I already met her. Um, the same way she described how she met the IT specialist, that's how we met. She okay, okay. She was at an uh, agriculture meeting where she was just, I suppose she just turned up to make up numbers. Um, I was in charge of the meeting. And okay. as a matter of fact, it was through um, this young lady who started the course with us, the journalist, um, oh Tofik. I had invited Tofik to the meeting and Tofik invited um, Lazarus. And that's, that's how we met about two years ago. And since then we have done projects together and stuff. So, so I, know what, you know, I know what she's about. No. All right. No further questions, comments. So we can take a look at note six. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon.
All right, so I was going through that note with you on Tuesday. And if I can pick up from where I left off, this is note six that I, that I shared with you. However, choosing the right marketing channel strategy to distribute your messages to your target audience and create stronger relationships with them is now more complicated. That is because we said, you know, we now have access to the web and all that. With all of these choices, what's important is to focus on selecting the right media channels for your business, both online and traditional. So what is a marketing communication channel? A marketing communication channel, also sometimes referred to as a media channel, is a delivery vehicle to your customers for your message or offer. I want to repeat that. That is the type of thing that people ask, you know, and when they have to have paper and pencil tests, you know, um, it's the type of thing people always ask. If you just hold once, oh, okay. Yeah, so those are the types of um, questions people tend to ask, you know, in a, in a multiple choice type format. So let me repeat. A marketing communication channel, also sometimes referred to as a media channel, is a delivery vehicle to your customers for your message or offer. It is just one element of a successful marketing campaign, albeit an important one. So combined with your messaging and the right creative for the channel, it can resonate with your ideal customers and encourage them to do business with you. And in our case, of course, it's in attracting volunteers, donors, and investors. So there's specifically saying here that all media channels can work, but all can fail as well. So it depends on how well you're, you integrate and deliver the important pieces of the marketing campaign. So now they went on to talk about some of the examples and I want to discuss these in some detail. So examples of marketing communication channels, you have traditional media channels such as print publications. And I think I, I spoke to most of you about this in terms of print publications, your local newspapers, writing articles in newsletters, even newsletters of other CSOs. So you may want to write something in Inspector as a newsletter, uh, Red Cross, etc. Right? So, how many of you have had experience, <clears throat> sorry, writing newspaper articles or any other type of print publication to highlight the work of your CSO? I, I sometimes submit articles in the newspaper, but it's only once. <laughs> It's only once I ever submit anything specifically to us in this. Okay. And what, do you mind sharing what it was about and what the impact was? Well, that had CSO, it, it's, it's part of a larger organization, the Baptist Alliance. And they had made a decision to, to really affirm women in a more. Oh, you're breaking you break up, Bonnie. Hold on, hold on one second. Does anyone else have a mic on? Karen, your mic is on. All right. Um, anybody else? Okay, continue, Bonnie. Sorry. All right. So, so I was saying it's, it's, it was the, the CSO was part of a larger organization, the Baptist World Alliance, that in Bahamas, maybe last uh, year before, to be last year, you know, they, they really pass a uh, um, some rules that really affirm women in a more quite uh, right way. Um, I did I did an article about it and sent it to the newspaper and I saw it publish it. And both that organization that you, you usually speak about, what's the name of it again? The the um, hold, on, hold on, hold on a second. Hold on a second, buddy. Okay, hold on. Just excuse me one minute.
Yeah, sorry about that, buddy. That's okay. Right. So I was saying that a few a few people in the organization was very happy with with that kind of publication because it's a funny moment. And the organization that I think you are part of, I, I did a presentation with them too, and they were very very happy. That that's S organization. Can remember the name now? Okay. Well, let me just let me just stop by asking you first. When you did the article, did you have a specific targeted number of people that you wanted to reach, a particular segment of the population that you wanted to reach? Or did you just write the article because, I mean, you know, you could write? I knew the article reaches both online and of course um, print. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wanted, I want specifically the religious community, those especially who feel that females are don't have should not have leadership position in church. I wanted them to to to, to at least see that article. And also that segment of persons, if you want to see the women's movement, to see the articles and and they saw it of course and they gave a lot of support to it. So yes, it was it was for some specific clients. So how were you able to measure the, the responses? Is it, is it the number of online views, the number of people who commented? How did you how did you get feedback on the impact of the? I couldn't measure the uh, scientific feedback, but it's just uh, persons communicating directly, and also persons communicating through you know through email and word of mouth, and the fact that. I put it in the Grenadian voice, which, which has an online, uh, I think maybe 100,000 views, I'm not too sure, for months. So it was still like informal, but I, I realized it met its target. All right. And then, of course, I did some journalism tricks, like, as I said, mentioned in the Back to Solar Lands, which, which takes it all, which gives a global perspective than, than just than just green air Caribbean. So you know that brought the scope. All right, but it, but you know, I'm sure you understand the importance of having an idea of which what kind of what kind of audience, which uh, the kind of numbers you're looking at, you know, especially if you had to pay for the article. I mean this was a free article I take it, right? Yeah, this was a free article, yes. Right, okay. All right, but so those are some of the considerations you'd want to have in place. Glenda, were you about to say something? No, no. Oh, sorry, my mic was open. No, no. Oh, no, sorry. I did not do articles like that. It's more like newsletter articles. Internal? Within, you know, regional, regional, yeah, the company had other regional branches. So I was a part of the committee that we did regional newsletter um, clippings. So it would be information that is geared to share among the companies, um, well, the various branches throughout the region. Okay. And um, basically what it was measured by is the way the staff would have responded to some of the stuff posted in there. And we would have, from that information, know what kind of, um, what kind of um, area they were interested in and what we can put more information up in the article when we do it again. So that is what I was engaged in. So when I keep talking about internal marketing, that's what, that's what came to mind, right? Yes. Okay, because as I said, that and 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 as Lazarus mentioned that as well, that the internal public is a very very important public. Yeah, right. because what that has done when we created that particular um, communication link between the different branches and in the region, mm -hmm. it has brought together a very large social group from the region, and we had a very nice time. Actually, we had a whole 10 days of activity, which was very, very good. We interacted, we went on island tours, you know, we did some cook-ups. It was really, really interactive. It was a really nice time. The only thing is my boss never full of himself. He drank too much rum. Yeah. <laughs> we had a combination of Canadian, St. Lucian, um, Barbadian. We had Antiguan because the company was, they had branches in those areas, yeah. Okay, cool. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. 
But so I would also say, see that nobody want to talk. I think customer feedback is important and it is really important for you to understand where your article is and what um, area of it that really interests them most. And it's also good to know that in writing, you're not just writing in vain, but you're writing an article and you're writing something that would interest the readers. So you have to know who your readers are and what will interest them and know how to channel your writing towards their interests that will basically give you the urge and the, in the, the encouragement to continue writing. Cool. All right, the second one listed is radio. Apart from Karen, who is judging stuff on radio, how many others have done radio interviews or radio segments or have been interviewed on radio for their CSOs or any kind of marketing effort? Anyone? Well, in my case, I did interview, but they eventually put me on the radio. Oh. <laughs> but it was like a private interview, yeah. OK, OK. Yeah. But none of you have done radio stuff for your CSOs? Yes, I have done a radio interview or two for my CSO. Which is what again? Remind me. The CSO that I was involving was, is called Grenadian Organization of Consumer Affairs. All right, okay. okay. And, and if I remember correctly, that was a genuine CSO by our definition in that it was with freely elected members, you all were in charge of governance of the organization, or it fell under a ministry? It's a, it's a true CSO. It, does, it did not fall under any ministry. Okay. And, but it does have some work to do. It does have some? It has some work to do, meaning that even though it's a, tree, a, a true CSO by definition, it has a lot of organization issues, a lot of governance issue and so forth. A lot of which is what this new CSO will attempt to address in due course. Okay. Yeah. And what, in what context were you on the radio? Did they choose you or this um, a, a radio person just happened to know you and ask you to come on or was it a structured part of the marketing campaign? Okay. Uh, we were involved in promoting biodegradable, biodegradable food bowls and utensils. Mm -hmm. So there was a company that, a local company that brings in these materials. Mm -hmm. So they were going to the radio station to talk about their products and they wanted the organization to kind of be with them to kind of make it look better in terms of the reputation. So I went with her, the public, their public relations person, in order to assist with talking about the benefits of biodegradable food bowls and so forth. Excellent. And that there are great alternatives because there was an issue with the type of bowls that were being imported. So we were saying that there are different bowls. You do not have to use a soggy bowl. There are different bowls for different things. Okay. Which that's when that's when it argument was, was a big argument, right? That that these containers don't hold soup properly. Was it? Was that, yes. That time? Yeah. Okay. I remember. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when you went on, did you see it as part of the marketing or branding campaign for the organization? Or is just something yes. that you felt you needed to do? I saw it as branded and marketing because it is a way for the organization, the name of the organization to get out there and also to help promote, to come up with a solution because normally people say what the problem is, but they never come with a solution. So we thought it was a good opportunity to say, here's this company, they have a solution. Cool. And was, was, there ever there, was there ever a public query as to what the relationship was between the organization and the company? 
Did you kind of no. like talk like that? That you know that you no, like nobody it? did that okay. because everything was above board. We did we weren't doing any secret deals or anything. Okay. So it was just basically a partnership, like you said. We should do partner. Hello, you're, you're breaking up, can you? Yes, there was a lot of no background noise, sorry about that. Oh, yeah. I was saying that it, it was a partnership. Okay. They were not taking advantage of us and we were not taking advantage of them. All right, true. We were working together. Okay, but you could, you could see where, if that isn't carefully managed, it can look as if, you know, the CSO has been bought by the company or the CSO is pushing a company head, you know, for, for their own profit, profit interests. Yes, I see how that, it can look like that. I do see right. that. Okay, cool. So I'm just saying that so that the next time any of you in any organization get involved in something like this, you have to be quite clear that your organization, your CSO isn't being drawn in as a, as too significant a part of the marketing of the, of the, of the for-profit. All right, because it's very easy for those lines to get um, crossed. Okay. Anyone else? Thanks, Kenya. Anyone else? Radio experience. Need a buddy. Okay. So one of the reasons why I want to do radio is that there's a particular, there are particular segments of the population that radio appeals to. Um, in Trinidad, there was a very popular farmer's program, which was managed and run by a, by a, 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 a for-profit profit company. But they were very clever in that, you know, that program started at 5.30 in the morning, which is the type, time that, you know, the target group that they were looking at, the farmers that they were looking at, that's the time that they'd be listening to the radio. And so, you know, this, this type of advertisement or communication is best at that time if you're targeting the farming population. Um, and it was even more targeted to the East Indian, the, the indo trinidadian population. So the music, just the introductory music and so would be East Indian sounding, um, and then the presenter who was um, Joe Pires, who was head of Caribbean Chemicals, would come on, and he had a very distinctive voice. And you know, you you could actually, you there was enough feedback so that you knew that he was reaching a target audience, and that this was something that was very popular in the East Indian farming community, right? Which which was his major his major target. So I'm saying that there are, there are certain demographics that you know that radio would appeal to, and the time that you that you you do the interview, and of course the station, because there are some. I mean, in in, in more developed um, telecommunications environments where you have literally dozens of radio stations, you have to pick the right type of radio station. If you go for a message for elderly demographic and you're going to hip hop station then you're not really you know, maximizing the, the the impact but if you go on an easy listening or uh, depending on how the, the the radio stations are um are laid out in terms of the audience the, the major audience that they're they're looking at then that is where you want to do your your radio interviews right any comments questions before i move yes, on sir. I can relate to, to that because not um, what we used to do um, with the company I worked with, we used to hire those same radio personnel. They used to do their own audios and then you pay them. Mm -hmm. And what, what we used to make them do was run it at a particular time of the day. So the, day, the time when you know um, they have certain program captured and person would zoom in and they have a call in, you know, them kind of time. So person's attention is, is, is there and... Um, they would flash a couple ads during those times so to bring, a, bring about awareness because one of, the, one of the things the company used to do is have, um, well, that's one of the company, they used to have like a yard sale or have this particular sales day where I'm telling you, just, just for cash flow reasons, right? And you just 
sell out everything. The people come in and buy what they don't even need. And it's because they capture the right audience at the right time, so then they come out, you know, and that's what happens. Yeah, but I mean, one, when you have a, a full-scale marketing department, whether it's mm-hmm. not a profit or a non-profit, those are some of the things that they'll be looking at, you know, advertisers as, mm-hmm. as well. We'd always go to the to the radio logs and find out you know, what type of listenership you have. You know, yes. there are agencies that do these surveys, and you could actually tell you, you know, the demographic. You know, the, it's sixty-five to seventy, or sixty-five to eighty-five, or, or twenty-five to thirty-five age bracket. They listen to so and so and so programs. Mm-hmm. So if you're targeting them, you know, if it's a if your organization is dealing with AIDS education and so then you and you have a target demographic in mind then you're not really i mean not that not that people over 65 can't get it it was just that in terms of when it was spreading rapidly it was a certain demographic that was you know that was really mostly at risk you know so you wanted that that 25 to 45 age group and you had to target their messaging to stations that they would be listening to right and not as as we say in China, not the old people station, right? The young people station. Yeah. But there are stations that get branded as because in China we have a lot of talk radio, we have uh, easy listening, you know, whole range of um of, okay. at one time I, I know that there are more than a dozen radio stations. I'm talking about FM now, right? Oh, radio station. And that was umpteen years ago, so a lot more now. So the, it's always a always difficult to, to pinpoint which radio station you should really, you know, appear, assuming that you have a choice, you know. If you can only go where you know somebody, but then, you know, you have to take it. And say things are a lot easier now in that you can broadcast your thing yourself on your YouTube channel, you know, so, right? Television, this was always the big one. Always the big one. This is one that I, I mean, I, was running, I wasn't running a non-profit, but I was running a for-profit, and I knew that you know, television was a, a really major one. Um, when, I, when I launched my company, the very first thing I did was to get myself featured in the business, the business section of the, of, the, of the Trinidad Guardian, which was one of the three leading newspapers in Trinidad at the time. So I made sure that you know, I had... Uh, a business editor. I knew I knew the business editor who was part of my network, and he put me on to a junior reporter, and they did a full three-quarter page. I mean, and those, those days Guardian was broadsheet, which is a big, big size paper. So a three-quarter on a broadsheet is a big thing, right? And that I launched the company, literally launched the company there. Right? Because I, if I remember correctly, the 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 byline was banking on the environment. Because when I started, you know, this all this climate change talk and so wasn't, you know, as, as popular as it is now. And, you know, and I remember the, the reporter putting in a line that, you know, that I came to the interview with my entire office. Because I told him that, you know, my entire office was this, this laptop that I had, you know, in, in my bag. So print, radio, television, I mean, those are the easy ones from, you know, from... From, from time immemorial, I mean, from, from electronic time. Um, the thing with TV ads, the thing with TV appearances now is that you can always download it from their, from their, um, from their online platform. In my time doing TV interviews for CSOs or for my own private business, you had to know somebody in the television station to get a copy of the tape. You know, you don't hear people talking about that again. Right? You need to get a copy of the tape because the, once it was broadcast, it was, became part of their archives and there was no online platform for them to have it stored on. So if you didn't go and ask for a copy of the tape or you didn't know enough people in the television station, then if you didn't have somebody record it at home on their, in those days was still um, VHS um, video and so, right? So then somebody have to be watching television at the time. So I remember in, in, in our case, we had this CSO that I belonged to. And 
while one of the board members was on TV, you know, you had to make sure that somebody would be at home, especially for the morning programs, because they're coming on on a seven o'clock morning program and you have to go to work. But you still have to either set your video, your video recorder to tape everything from seven, between seven and eight, you know, and hope that you catch, you catch your, um, your colleague's presentation your, or interview in that time, or have somebody, have their spouse or whoever it is, will be at home to remember to go at seven o'clock and, you know, and follow the program and so on. That, that used to be a major challenge. I say it's no longer such a challenge because most, most television stations would have an online platform and you can always go and you know, find the interview on, on YouTube or on the Facebook page and then you can always use you know, various apps to cut, to cut and paste your, um, your particular section of the interview. Um, I know that, that that's been done, you know, I'm sure a number of you saw we had a copy of a, is Jeanette on? We had a copy of Jeanette James talking about with her um, the guy with the football foundation. So, you know, so we know that that is, that is a, a, a useful format, you know, television in really, very really useful format because- That's Jason they, Roberts Foundation. Jason Roberts Foundation. So you get, you know, you get the audio and the video. I mean, and in its time, it was the most powerful media, right? It was, it was the Instagram of those, of the, in those days, you know, the YouTube of those days. So that um, some of us actually got branded as, you know, as, as, as liking TV too much, you know, because, you know, you had, you had to put your brand out there. Right? And it had to be, so I made it a point in, I think, I think it's safe to say that in, I have been on public media in every CARICOM country, if not print, radio, or TV, right? primarily TV. And it's all part of the initial marketing. It's all part of the branding. It's all part of getting that, you know, getting your, the word out about what you do and how you do it. Welcome, Michael. So billboards are also very, very good. I know Spectre, uh, sorry to be using Spectre all the time, but uh, it's the organization that I'm, I know the most about and great about it. I know Spectre has some really, really, really interesting billboards in St. Patrick's and around the Levera area. So, so um, what about you guys? Anybody, any of you belong to CSOs that did a, a billboard? And I'm talking about the traditional billboards now, not the electronic ones. You know, they were literally a, a giant painting or a giant mural. Um, any of you associated with anything like that? No one? Vistra, Fletch. Michael, were you never featured on a billboard? How you get to be the most popular man in the parish if you were never on a billboard? What kind of thing is that? I'm sorry, I, I just come in and i um, distracted. I'm having a little session at, at the house, so I'm sort of distracted. What was the question? I was saying that I was going through the various media channels and mm -hmm. I mentioned print, radio, television, and billboards. And I was asking you if you ever appeared on any of those, television, radio, billboards, connected with your CSO. Because as the most popular man in the parish, I mean, there must have been some way. Is it only by word of mouth? Only by word of mouth or you want? You, you want to build both to fall? <laughs> you want to build both to fall down? No, <laughs> no if, I, I, would, I would have expected you to see something. I feel like one of my friends at campus, Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, hi. Yeah. So, Jeanette will you have respect. Used to boast, used to boast about how his um, every time they put up his picture on on posters and thing on campus, some young girl used to tip it off, you know, because I mean, oh, because apparently such a sharp fellow in his own mind. Yeah, um, I, 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 I got most of my popularity in um, with a mouth. like. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I'm not a, I'm not a, a media person. Okay, okay, okay. Because I know most times people tell you, you have a face for radio. But anyway. No, no, you know, I don't, you know I do. <laughs> Fletch. Hi, hi. Fletcher, what about you? You've been featured on billboards. On radio. Ramsey? Yes, love. Have you been on radio? TV on billboards for your promoting your CSO? No, no, sir, I haven't. Not yet. No, not yet. Very good. That's the correct. That's the correct. Okay. But not Mr. Yet. Steve, Mr. Maximi. Yes. But I've um I've done interviews though, um radio um television. But no, um I, I, know, I know that. I mean I you you obviously it because I mean I you can't get to be the most popular man in the fire. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't understand that. And, uh, I, don't. I knew I knew it was distracted, you know. You had some fun. Yeah, it's it's my roommates, but yeah, we have another little session. Um I also was the PRO in, in, in tourism, so you know, after Jeanette left, I took the position. So oh, okay. I I had a little experience there too, you know, the um you know, doing what, what 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 ministry does. All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, very popular. Last you know, I did lots of interviews as well when I was going for Queen Show, eh? And <laughs> I recently saw my video on YouTube <laughs> when I went for Queen Show too. But I just don't like it. I don't like to be um out there. Why not? I just don't you have don't, don't you have a, don't you have a message to communicate? Yes, I do. I do. Well, then if you do, then you have to be out there, as you put it. Yes, I yes, I have to. I don't have a choice in the matter. There yeah. you go. Once you yeah. realize that, once you keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, Jeanette, we, sorry, sorry, Sam. Jeanette, we already spoke about your, your appearances on TV with the Jason um, Foundation. Is there anything else? Have you been featured on billboards? Has your face been <laughs> plastered on a billboard? Well... <laughs> Yeah. Well, actually, there would be like news clippings from years ago when I, when I did public relations for Ministry of Tourism and stuff. So there was a lot of that traveling, interviews, running press conferences, those kinds of things. So they're all over the place. I'll have to search for them and, you know, <laughs> and put them up or something. All right. All right. Yeah. Yes, before we go on to signage and telephone. I drive and so I can't talk. Sorry? Kevin, waiting on you. He's driving so he cannot speak. Oh, okay, okay, cool, 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 cool. cool. Yeah, don't but, uh, Yeah, not sure. As you asked Ronnie the question there, something just popped up in my mind out of curiosity. Uh-huh. The oldest of the oldest tell a woman grapevine, where does that fit, fit in into what we're speaking about? You mean niggagram? I don't sure if it's nigger, but tell somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 we'll come to that. We'll come to that. But as a channel, as a channel, you know, that is as a more informal channel, you know. Just, just blow them out, you know. But signage, telephones would be a, a formal way to do that. That you can have a a, a telephone based, a phone campaign where you know, which as those of you who have ever lived in or spent time in the U.S. would know that that's a major, major um, source of disturbance for for, for for Americans in that you have all these at agencies and things that just randomly call your phone, you know, and ask your host of arbitrary questions, you know, so that a number of people have actually, actually screened their calls because they don't want, you know, these advertisers and people, either politician, politicians or 
or, or for profits or even non profits calling you constantly to allegedly interview you and conduct surveys and so. So that is a that's another area. But the postal service, of course, I mean, you know, they have, they, in the old days you'd have mail out mail out programs where you just do a, a thousand flyers or so and you send those you send those flyers out to the mail. Another way that you, you could use newspapers, if you, can, if you couldn't get an article published in the newspaper, what you would do is you would print the flyers and then have the newspapers insert the flyer into it. You know, so all the distributors and so will go to. And that, that was a, a useful demographic, demographic because the people who could afford to have papers delivered at home usually used to be in a particular economic bracket, you know, so that you know that they would be more prone or more, more able to, um, to, to support your, your, your nonprofit. And then of course you had events. And those events could range from your, your barbecue to your boot ride, to not just as a fundraiser, but as a means of, of getting your brand out there, getting your message out there, right? Further questions? Okay, so now we come to the more popular ones nowadays, like websites. So and most of the organizations that you would have belonged to or belong to now would most likely have a website. Um, blogs have taken over from getting newspaper articles. So rather than write a whole set of articles, send them into the press and or via letters to the editor or whatever avenue and not have them publish, you can publish it yourself. Just start a digital a blog, you know, and you can have your, you can have your message communicated to a wide audience just by using a, a blog. And some of these blogs are, I mean, they're digital blogs, but they are very, very popular. There are some with, you know, with a readership that might exceed some of the smaller newspapers out there. Podcasts, social media interactions, email. So now the email has taken over from the original post out where you had to actually send all these letters out. You could just do a, a, a email dump. And the difficulty with that is that a lot of us have sophisticated um, email browsing capabilities now so that we could put those things in the junk one time. Once we see anything coming into our email, our inbox that has multiple addresses, it will most likely go into your junk folder because to be alive nowadays is to be subject to all of these kinds of marketing inputs. And as you know, you look through your email and you always find a whole lot of advertising, you know, that some of which most of which is unsolicited and unappreciated. Video. This is another area that I really, really, really like and spend a lot of time and effort in developing. But you must have video out there. Whether it be for, as a training mechanism or part of the overall marketing efforts, video is you know, literally at the top of the the top of the list. Webinars, well, you're seeing the, the increase in webinars now, especially in this, in this COVID era, where whereas an organization may have, you know, attempted to run seminars, workshops, they're all now being categorized into the, the webinar category so that you can be socially distanced, you know, and you still, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, you can still have an interactive um, session via your webinar. All right. So 
Anybody has any thing to add? Any? Do you see anything missing in these channels listed? Is anyone, can anyone think of a channel that isn't listed here? Apart from tell a friend. Um, Facebook pages. Facebook. Yeah. Social media. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Twitters, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the former popular one of bumper stickers. Ah. There was a time when that was really, really, really effective. Really. Bumper stickers. I mean, one of the one of the things I think I mentioned this in class before, you know is that one of the really, really interesting marketing channels that is used in Grenada that is not used in Trinidad at all, 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 is this business of having your school tie um, back glass stickers. I mean, at university level, you know, if, you, if you've been to Penn State or, you know, you went to University of Chicago and so they, you can get a, a, a back glass liner that says that, but at the secondary school level in Trinidad, that is not done at all, at all, at all, at all. And that's why the many ideas that I thought of literally transposing into Trinidad into my old alma mater. Because I mean, you know, when, the thing is that a lot of the schools in Trinidad did away with tires, even for the dress uniform. Right, so it's, it's mostly prestige schools in Trinidad that still have, that still use ties, right? So that most times it's where the monogram, which are, uh, a pocket monogram that is the major identifier of your school, especially if you went to a, a government secondary school or one of the not so prestigious um, denominational denominational school, denominational school, denominational school. Right, so that is that is something that we that hasn't been mentioned here, Vanya. You're right, quite right. Bumper stickers and stickers generally for your t-shirts for, for vehicles and so. Um, Our guest speaker mentioned it two days ago, and the guest speaker to come will mention it as well because that is her that is her rare, rare baby, but. I don't want to steal any of her thunder. She's already watching my heart. Um, so I'll leave that to when the next guest speaker comes on in the next 10 minutes, next 10 minutes, next nine minutes. All right. Um, so so wouldn't, wouldn't any form of memorabilia be effective? Yep. That is coming as well. As I say, like you're looking at my, you're looking at my, you're looking at my table because that is when the next speaker is going to talk about that. So, oh, yes, oh, okay. so I don't, I don't want to steal her thunder um, because I have to live here afterwards. All right. So the marketing strategies are the types of communication you do to get your message in front of your target market using the most appropriate channel. For traditional media channels, you could choose, you know, paid advertising, direct marketing, word of mouth, notice, events, public relations, partnerships and joint ventures. So Kenya would have been in a partnership with the company doing the packaging so that her CSO didn't have to do all the background maneuvering to get the interview. She just had a turn up. So for digital marketing, there are examples of strategies you could use. You could invest inbound marketing, spend some time on that later. Content marketing, email marketing, which most of you know. Search engine optimization, that is somewhat costly. And then you can do a local search. Then you, of course, there's always paid advertising, there's mobile marketing, then there's affiliate marketing. Now, before we get into too much of a discussion on that, 
I want to be sure that I leave, I don't start anything that will encroach on the next speaker's time from six. So let me just spend a little more time on, on videos. So videos via YouTube can appeal to many. You can build your, a quality channel, right? Um, one of the ways of relating the two is by having your Facebook likes translated into um, viewership on your YouTube channel. And the background facilities in, on a YouTube channel gives you an idea of the demographics of your reach, where the people are viewing it from, you know, which countries they're viewing it from. So if you have a local CSO, you want to be sure that your content is so Grenada relevant and also relevant to Grenadians in diaspora. Right, because that's where a lot of your investment can come from. Because you are trying to do something in St. Mark or in St. John, and uh, there may be very wealthy residents, former residents of, of St. Mark and St. John, etc., living in the diaspora. And if you get a chance to, to support you, invest either in some sort of crowd, crowdfunding mechanism, then you're right on the money with a with a YouTube video. Email marketing, that is a, a, a more specialized activity. I am very wary of that because it's just like the traditional mail out before. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of wastage in the sense that, you know, you're, it's such a scattershot arrangement if it's done improperly that you end up just flooding people's inboxes and then, you know, having them assign it to the junk, to the junk mail anyhow, right? Um, some of these email mail outs have to be personalized. You have to use the proper software so that you don't send out something with, you know, with 25 respondents. Each, each time it goes out, it looks as if it's directly targeted at that particular person, right? And I know that my own junk box is full of all of these mail outs with, you know, 600 recipients. So nobody's really interested in that. So what about subscription? Yeah. Like for example, um, maybe I'm a CSO or an organization that deals with a specific product or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look for uh, other businesses that falls within my range, and I organize subscriptions if it's monthly or quarterly that can probably help them in regards to the building up of their own organization. Is that a way to market my? It is, it is, but it calls for a deliberate and planned and coordinated effort and an understanding of the online technology as well. Because um, you could easily find yourself subscribing to a range of um, entities and not get anything out of it. So that one of the things we'd have to go back to is what we said in the beginning of this section of the course, that you really want to have targeted operations and have set goals. So you have a, a figure in mind, a number in mind, a demographic in mind, when you start these things. So that it's just, just, you don't want to be doing too much of scattershot type arrangement. Because remember, I kept, when we talk, when we spoke in the previous course, I was saying, look, you want to be always seeking assistance and you know, investors and so they don't want to be defined by it. They don't want, by the time people see your letterhead, they know that, you know, they come in and ask for something, right? And if you're, there's, there's a, a point at which, you know, you become so visible and your visibility is only connected with asking for something. It's never in giving back or in presenting findings 
or in coming up with solutions, as Kenya mentioned. Because right? there are some CSOs that are only associated with the problem. Every time you see them, hear them, or smell them, it is about some problem. Right? And not enough times you actually hear, you know, what are some of the solutions? What are some of the things that we can do? What are some of the things that they have been doing? Because part of your marketing effort is to really tout your successes, you know? Because you can't always be asking people to invest in something that has never accomplished anything yet, right? As part of your marketing program, you want to list all your accomplishments and not just highlight the questions they keep asking, you know? The marketing campaign should not be based on, you know how long we're asking government for so and so, you know how long we're asking government for so and so. Of course, everybody, all right, so okay, so we know you've been doing that, you've been at it a long time. But maybe it's because you're so ineffective that another CSO should probably take it up. Because if you've been at it for 11 years and you haven't got anything to show, then I think you just wasted 11 years. So as part of that marketing campaign should be heralding your successes. And if, you, if after five years you have no successes, then you have to ask yourself some serious questions. Is this a mission that you can really, really take, take on? Have you bitten off more than you can chew? All right? So if you just hold for a second, let me invite the second in our series of guest speakers of professionals who have been there and done that. If you just give me one second, I will see if I can find the guest speaker. People, let me introduce you to Ms. Abisha Tuse Maxime, mm -hmm. who is going to handle the next 30 or so minutes. So, Ms. Maxime, these are my peeps, mm -hmm. and they're here waiting on you. So, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Maxime. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How is everyone this afternoon? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, mm -hmm. afternoon. That's good. Okay, so I'll jump straight into it. I don't want to be too long to bore you. Um, well, most of you, like Steve said, my name is Abisha Tuse Maxime. Maxime is a recent handle. Um, <laughs> um, he invited me here to speak about the Trinidad and Tobago Endometriosis Association. Are you seeing my logo? E T T E A. Yeah, yeah, I need to see it. <laughs> so that's a nonprofit I founded together with some other founding members. Um, I'm currently also serving on the World Endometriosis Organization Steering Committee. Before we talk about uh, before we get into the topic, I just want to talk a little bit about um, endometriosis. I noticed that we have some men in our midst. How comfortable are you talking about female stuff? We're not going to be too heavy, heavy, but it will be female. So it's all sweet. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm, I, for those of you who haven't heard about endometriosis, um, Simply put, it is where the 
tissue that is similar to the lining of the uterus. It's not the same thing, but it is similar to the lining of the uterus. It go grows in other parts of the body. And because it grows in other parts of the body, there, there will be a lot of problems associated with it. You look at uh, uh, chronic inflammation, pain, I mean, and the list goes on, yeah? In Trinidad, we have about roughly about 35,000 women and girls suffering from endometriosis. Uh, it is felt, uh, we feel that the incident is a bit higher, um, but we will go with what the uh, formula indicated to us. So it's about 35,000. Here in Grenada, persons who know that I'm involved in that kind of work and they approach me. Um, so far, I was able to help one person, a colleague of mine, her daughter, was diagnosed with it. And um, thank God she took good advice and she was in a position where she could have gone to a doctor in the UK, an endometriosis specialist in the UK and received treatment. Um, so she's currently doing well, but I mean, if you know endometriosis is one of those diseases where it's pretty miserable, it's very mysterious, and many women suffer in silence, and many doctors, they don't like to deal with it because they, most of them refer to it as a recurring decimal you know and to get proper endometriosis care is a lot of money a lot a lot of money in the u.s you probably have like about let's say about 15 this is the entire u.s you probably have about 15 gynecologists that has a special interest in it and um, what i mean by that is um they would have dedicated their practice to it. they would have done a uh, fellowship they would have attend meetings on it and so forth. They would do advanced uh, laparoscopy and so forth. So in the US, we have about 15. In the Caribbean, um, I don't know about any, any per se. Trinidad, about three years ago, uh, Dr. Brady, he moved from the UK to Trinidad. So he resides in Trinidad now and he was really a godsend. So we are working with him and he has a lot of experience in that area. So if we actually have to recommend anybody, we don't like recommending any doctors for many reasons, but if we have to recommend anybody, we would recommend Dr. Brady. There's also Dr. Um, Corona in Barbados, but she's up more on the fertility side of things, yeah? I'll stop here for the moment because, I mean, I could go on and on about endometriosis. I'm really not here to talk about endometriosis this afternoon. Yeah. But if you don't mind, can I ask a question though? Sure, no problem. Um, what is the possibility of after having a surgery um, that it, um, it repeats itself? Um, that's not really as straightforward. Um, there's okay, no let me rephrase it. Can someone do a surgery to to repair that problem and have a, a repeat of the diagnosis then. Yeah, and that's, that's part of, that's a huge part of the problem with women and girls today. And that's why I said that there are very few um, doctors who have a special in, interest in endometriosis. And you have to understand the genesis of the problem. The genesis of the problem goes back to uh, medical school and the training and the theory that they use, right? And because of that particular theory, uh, it is felt that uh, it is estrogen dependent. And so if you starve the patient of, of estrogen, then the disease will go away. But what uh, current research is showing that for some women, especially those who are advanced, what you do is you have to properly perform the surgery and actually excise, cut out. And this takes time, probably depending on the stage of the endometriosis or the extent of the endometriosis, of endometriosis, 
you're looking at a surgery that might be four hours minimum. In advanced cases, when I went abroad, like in 2017, my surgery took eight and a half hours. And the problem is that if the surgery is not done properly, then it's going to cause complication for any surgeries after. Because you're going to, there's a possibility of developing uh, adhesions, scar tissue, and it's going to make it more difficult for the surgeon to do what he needs to do. So what that surgeon could have done like initially first, because three or four other doctors who didn't have that special interest in endometriosis and persons are not quite knowledgeable about endometriosis. So they went to a regular gynecologist and the gynecologist would have performed like two or three surgeries hoping to remove the, hoping to remove the endometriosis and all the endometriosis was not removed. You're not gonna have the endometriosis continuing to do what it does. Scar tissue, um, adhesions, and other complications. So it, 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 makes it, it makes it more difficult for the doctor who can properly manage the disease. Yeah, so we always advise persons, especially if it is your first surgery, to come to us and have a conversation with us so that we can tell you some of the things you can look for so that when you go to your doctor, you will ask all the questions, you will have all the information, and you will make an informed decision. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions on endometriosis before I move on? It just captured my attention when I heard you speak about this. I was curious to, to yeah. know well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, in terms of my work with the TTEA, well, first to begin, there was, a, there was this big gap. There was this gap in treatment. And how, how, do, how do I say it without um, there, there's, there's this big issue we call endometriosis. And because doctors, um, they don't like to treat it, sorry, they don't like to deal with it. And the treatment approaches are used by most doctors are not effective. You find women mm -hmm. undergo, let's say, three, four, five, six, eight surgeries, 10 surgeries. And there's still evidence of endometriosis. There's still, the patient is still enjoying a, a, a poor quality of life. And sometimes they feel as though the medical professionals are not listening to them. Sometimes they feel despondent, they feel hopeless. And it was out of that the TTEA was born. Yeah? Um, when I started the TTEA, I didn't want to do it at all because I felt as though my personal life would be under scrutiny. But after I approached everybody and they decided, well, yes, they're going to serve on the executive, but under one condition that I have to be president and founder, I didn't have a choice in the matter. So this is me here up with the TT, here serving with the TTEA up till today. Yeah, so there's this gap and the gap is in the treatment approaches because quite often women are misdiagnosed. They are um, there's a delay in diagnosis, and those are the two biggest problems when it comes to endometriosis, yeah? So Mr. Maxime invited me here today to talk a little bit about uh, marketing, practical marketing tips from my experience with the TTEA. I will not use the, I will not get into the traditional Marketing, tip, marketing tips like the different channels and so forth, because I assume he would have done most of that. We will touch a little bit on it because we do, we do quite a number of events. So I will touch a little bit on that. 
but I'm going to talk more about, let's say the non-traditional um, marketing tips. The truth, and in fact, the truth and fact is marketing is in everything. It is in every single thing you do with that organization. And that's the first thing we need to know. For us, um, the name of the CSO, the Trinidad and Tobago Endometriosis Association, was important. I sure if I ask some of the men or some women, have you heard about endometriosis before? They will tell you no. They would, they would tell me no, right? It's the same problem we were having in Trinidad and Tobago. We were asking, they said, endometriosis association, persons who know about it, well, they knew about it. But in terms of reaching those who were undiagnosed and were exhibiting symptoms of endometriosis, had suspected cases of endometriosis, it means that we now had to market the association at the front way. We didn't change the name at all. And even if we change the name, because last week at a board meeting, we did change the name. So we now we're looking at calling it endometriosis Canada and Tobago. But for some people, they don't know what endometriosis is. The name is so long, you know, it could be a real turn off. So whenever we do interviews, whenever we do any branded material, any form of marketing at all, what we do is what people know. We start with what they know and we simply ask them, do you know any woman who's experiencing debilitating period pain? That period pain will keep them from doing their day-to-day -day activities. When they take the painkillers, the painkillers don't work. And even if it works, it works just for a time. I mean, and you could really tell someone who has symptoms of endometriosis from just, let's say, regular period pain. And those are the persons we are hoping to reach. And then a lot more persons will join the conversation and they would say, well, yes, we know so-and-so. And you know my daughter, so-and-so, and so-and-so. And you know my daughter. And I told her to go to the doctor and you know you have all these... Um, how do they call it? Midwife tales that you will grow out of it and, 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 and um, after you have your baby, you wouldn't get the pain again and you know, all that. And we start hearing all these stories and those are the persons that we really want to hear about because that is our reach. And we didn't just want to reach them, we wanted to reach the persons who care for them. So the TTA has something we call a uh, being your sister's keeper. So it doesn't matter where you are, where you work or what gender you are. It doesn't, that's completely irrelevant. But once you notice that this person is exhibiting these symptoms, then you need to encourage that person to go to the doctor, one, and two, contact the Trinidad and Tobago Endometriosis Association. So in this case, the name of the CSO was extremely important, yeah? The other thing in terms of marketing tip that was extremely important for us was the governance structure. People could be really funny. Sometimes they look, they observe, and they don't say much. But if you don't have a proper governance structure in place, uh, persons that you would want to get involved in the association, won't get involved. And so you need to put a proper governance structure in place. And for us, um, we have on our executive, we have the vice president, we have the vice president, we have the treasurer, the secretary, the assistant treasurers, the assistant secretaries, uh, a trustee and a medical officer who is now, who that position has now changed to health officer, right? And in addition to that, we have like an ordinary member who is also a medical doctor. And uh, our patron is the former first lady of Trinidad and Tobago who everybody loves. No one speaks ill of her. So they add a certain level of credibility to our structure. 
right? And the roles are clearly defined. You see the different faces for uh, events. Um, it's clearly published on our website, you know? And persons, I think they, they like that. They really, they really like that. The next thing, which kind of tied into the point I was talking about uh, a little while ago, is the reputation, the qualities, and the image of the members of the executive and the board. That's also critical. I mean, if you have someone whose character is not in good standing, um, someone whose reputation is questionable, that definitely takes away from um, the CSO and marketing as a whole. Because when you approach, when you approach uh, different sponsors or donors, they definitely want to know the members of your executive. Um, and so if you have credible persons, persons in good standing with good qualities, they know that they're honest, are they trustworthy, they're really committed. It's not about uh, personal gain, it's more about selflessness and helping those in need. Uh, other persons, they will join in. It will be natural. You find that persons would want to follow the association. Now, they may not have the time to serve on the executive or volunteer with the, um, the CSO, but they will definitely contribute or chip in wherever they can. For example, uh, with the TTEA, when we have events, some of these events are kind of big, and we will get into that in a bit, that we will require additional volunteers. And so these persons will come on for these special occasions to volunteer, yeah? In terms of policy, process, and procedures, and bylaws, that's another important uh, way to market. You see it, so you need to have all your policies in place, you need to have all your, process, uh, your processes in place, uh, your procedures, and your bylaws. Currently, TTA has its bylaws, it has some process policies and some processes and procedures in place. But what we always have to remember is that, well, with the TTEA, most of the persons serving on the executive is volunteering and they work full time. So sometimes they might feel persons do not want to perform a certain task, but the reality is that they just don't have the time. And on days when you, let's say on public holidays and stuff, um, because you work like seven days a week on public holidays, you really want to relax, you know, revive a bit so that you can move on on the next working day. Uh, it's a challenge for us because we need to, capture everything in writing, like the policies, the procedures, the processes. And we need it more so because recently, as, as, as recent as last week, Friday, what we would have done, we would have separated the board from the executive. So it means that, um, for example, for me, where I could have provided oversight for everything, it means I can no longer do that. And the only how you can have uh, everybody doing what they're supposed to do and to be fair to the CSO and to the person serving in this position is to give them something in writing. So it's pretty much like a, like a for-profit company. The only difference is that whatever receipts you have in terms of money and funds, you cannot take it for yourself. That's a major difference. But in terms of policy, uh, bylaws and so forth, everything else has to be in place. So we're doing quite good, but I have to admit that that's an area of challenge for us, but it's something we are working on because persons, they need to know before they come in or accept a position, they want to know what they're getting into. We're supposed to give them their instruments meaning their letter outlining exactly what is expected, what you're expected to do, who you're supposed to report to, and all these things. 
Um, but it's something we're working on and we are mindful of it. So it's a start for us. So let's say hopefully within the next two months, we should have that sorted out. But it is definitely a marketing tool. And when I say a marketing, a marketing tool, uh, let's say you are targeting someone to serve on your executive or your board. And it's a friend of someone who is currently, or it's, let's say, a friend or a colleague of someone who's currently serving on the board. Based on what the person who is serving on the board tells that other person, that person will then decide whether he or she will want to serve on the board. So that is also extremely important. Yeah? Um, in terms of accounting measures, initially in the start, that was one of the challenging uh, areas for us. I used to lose a lot of nights sleep over it because it's money, it's public funds. Persons would have given donations, uh, sponsorship and so forth to the TTEA. And we needed to put proper measures in place. Now, uh, those measures are in place about two or three years ago we would have advertised for someone to um, fill the position of treasurer and we were actually looking for someone with accounting skills. And we were lucky enough uh, when that person came forward. And she's still with us today. And up to this day, she has put so many structures in place and she's continuing to put structures in place. So when it comes to public funds and um, and accounting for public funds. I must say that in itself is a marketing tip because there are some persons who may not say anything, but they're actually looking to see uh, how you are treating with the funds collected. Not only that, if you, at the same time you, you happen to get a new vehicle or so forth, they might associate one with the other. So to cover yourself, to cover the persons who are volunteering with you, it is important that you have proper accounting measures in place. Uh, currently, we are working on actually auditing the accounts of the TTEA, and we're trying to really get a credible, one of the more credible auditors, so that we can publish it. And when we publish this information, that too will be another uh, marketing tool because it will attract certain persons because for them it's accountability and transparency. Right? Um, what else? Am I missing anything there? I think that should cover it for uh, accounting measures. In terms of policy for fundraisers, we do have, it's, it's a nonprofit, and um, you may think that you don't need resources, but you do. And while as a CSO, you would have access the resources, the, one of the most important resources will be funds. And so you always have to have policy in place for fundraising. So we do have policies in place. We do have um, fundraisers. From our past fundraisers, what we do uh, to ensure that persons continue to support us um, we make them comfortable. Making them comfortable is extremely important when they are participating in the fundraiser. That's one. The second thing is um, giving them what they are expecting. And if you can give more, that will also be a good tip. And after the fundraiser, be it on your social platform, your social media platform, or an email blast, you definitely want to thank all those who would have participated. Um, in terms of persons who would have sponsored uh, that event, you definitely need to write them and let them know how much was made, whether you reach your target, or you did not reach a target, and whether you think uh, this fundraiser is plausible. 
uh, to continue with in the future, yeah? So we do all those things. And I think it's because of, it is because we do all these things that whenever we go back to our donors and sponsors, they continuously support us. And what is important to note is that we always get new sponsors and donors, always. We always get new sponsors and donors. And I think it has a lot to do with our policy for fundraising. Uh, we also, at the end of the fundraiser, whoever is in charge, that person will have to provide a report. That is also very, very important. The problem we are having with the report is the same thing I would have mentioned previously. Because persons are working full time and they are doing this, doing this uh, part time pro bono, you find that they may not have the time. So what we have decided is to do a form, to create a form for the complete immediately after the event so that it will be good for record keeping, number one, in the event that, let's say, six months later down the road, they're not writing the report. They have that information to insert in the report. We can use that completed form to, as, an, uh, as an appendix or a supporting document to send to our sponsors and donors, as well as to submit to uh, the board of directors. Yeah, so I think we, we try to cover all bases. So the form will be important and for record keeping. So um, fundraisers are quite important and the policies are quite important. And depending on how you treat with it, that will determine whether per persons will continue to support you or not. Or if you can move from, let's say, 250 to 300, yeah, supporters. In terms of another important tip would be maintaining relationship with your stakeholders, all your stakeholders. It's a bit exhausting, I know. It's really, really exhausting. But what we try to do, especially at the end of the year, um, we send some sort of greetings to them, thanking them for, support it, for their support during that year and expressing uh, our, how to phrase it, or looking forward to their continued support for the following year. And I think that is highly appreciated by most um, supporters. The funny part is that when you don't do it, um, and you think, you know, sometimes you think you're doing something and it's not important, and nobody's really paying attention, and then you decide to stop doing it. And then put somebody would reach out and say, well, why are you not doing so-and-so, or we did not receive so-and-so. We did enjoy receiving so and so we did enjoy reading this, you know. So persons do look forward to it, whether they, whether they reply to it or not, it is important that you send some sort of greetings to them at the end of that year. Yeah? What we also do on our social media platforms as well, let's say it's depending on the public holiday. Let's say Mother's Day, Father's Day, Carnival, Labor Day you know, we wish them well from the Trinidad and Tobago Endometriosis Association. And sometimes it is as simple as just posting a poster on these platforms, you know, and I think they, they, they really appreciate it. So that too is another marketing tip. Um, the use of free communication tools, I mean, that is what is really carrying us as a CSO. Funding is, funding is, is always a challenge. So the more you can tap into these free resources, the better for you. Um, you have the Facebook, everybody's on Facebook. And if they, if they are not on Facebook because their mommy and daddy is on Facebook, then they're probably on Instagram. So depending on the demographic you are targeting, targeting, targeting then you create a, um, a profile on one of these uh, social media platforms in terms of um, there's MailChimp we really like MailChimp because through MailChimp we usually uh, 
create our email listing and we are able to reach send communication to reach everyone you know um and there's there are some others there are who there are so many actually that you can choose from but we just chose those that are that we think that are the more popular ones that we have control over and most importantly the demographic we are trying to reach Another um, important marketing tip here would be networking. For example, one of the concerns I had in starting a CSO was whether or not I would have all the skills and competencies required for the CSO and whether or not I could reach the persons that I need to reach to get them involved in the CSO. It turned out that I didn't, but what I had working for me was networking. And by that, I mean, I knew somebody who knew somebody. And because they know me, and again, this is where reputation, quality, good standing, second to your word comes in. They know me and what I'm about, or they probably know Daniel and they know what he's about. Or when Steve used to serve on the executive, they knew him, you know, and they could vouch for him. They would intercede for us. And so persons get involved. Because I didn't know our first lady personally. Now we have an extremely good relationship, our former first lady. But I knew someone who knew her quite well. He is into that, um, he's into those circles. So when I called him and I told him, I said, um, I'm looking for a patron for the TTPA. Do you think we can go with so and so and so and so? He said, well, no, we can't go with so and so and so, but I think the former first lady, she would be the best fit for that position because she's a fabul, everybody loves her. I mean, I mean, she's just lovable. And she takes the course very seriously. And uh, yeah, we approach her, we, did, we do the necessary letters, uh, we, had, we had the meeting, and the rest was history. She's he here today with us at every important event. She is here, she walks around, she talks to all the doctors, she talks to all the sponsors, and she's the person, she, let's say she's, she's a neutral force in the mix, which is important. It's really important. If we have to get something in the, in the media, uh, Daniel, he has, he is our, he is, a, I'm trying to remember, he is the head of communication in what is equivalent to Nawasa here. We call it Wasa in Trinidad. So he has all that media contact. So apart from him, uh, Mr. Maxime as well, Steve, he has contact in the media as well. So between the both of them, we will navigate between the both of them. They will put their network into action and then we get the product we are looking for. It's either we get the interview, we get a free promotion, the article in the newspaper. So networking is really, really important. Oh, yes, he was just reminding me here about um, a seminar we had where we actually brought in the guest speaker from New Zealand. And uh, she, yeah, well, we, we did. He was saying that I panic about the course, which I did because you're looking at what about what close to a hundred thousand dollars. But we we managed to generate the funds, we did, we covered all our expenses. And interestingly enough, we, two of our major sponsors were government ministries. Yeah, and it's not easy to get money from the government. Um, and when Deborah came in, we had some, we did some television interviews and the impact was incredible because not only did we have, let's say 250 persons 
over 250 persons attending in Trinidad. We had over 50 persons attended in Tobago. How we operate is whenever we do something in Trinidad, we do it in Tobago because we try not to upset anyone. So we are always cognizant of certain things. And we cannot take Trinidadians to go to Tobago to have discussions with Tobago without any Tobagonians. Tobagonians must be involved. That's how we operate. Those are the kind of policies we have in place, which I think is also a very good marketing tip. Marketing tip. And, um, and the woman, they actually said that they were hopeful. And as a matter of fact, before Deborah came to Trinidad, the TTEA was regurgitating outdated information. It's only when Deborah came to Trinidad for the seminar, this is the guest speaker, we, we realized that she, we had a meeting. She had a meeting with the executive and stuff after, right? She indicated to us that the information, we are is outdated information and we were getting the information from our doctors interestingly enough so what i had to do i had to now join the world endometriosis society and when persons hear the world endometriosis society they think well okay probably it's a group of non-medics no you have scientists and medical professionals they are the ones who would have dedicated and committed their practice and time to research to, to, to um to their practice as um, to endometriosis, sorry, dedicated their practice to endometriosis and to advance the research, which is so important. And after that, we had to review all our literature. We had to review all our literature. And today, our literature is consistent, it's very consistent with current research and best practice. So you find that it slightly deviates from what you would hear from a doctor that does not have a special interest in endometriosis. And when I say a doctor, I'm talking about gynecologists specifically. Yeah? And um, two, or two last, my two last points would be the growth of the, C, the CSO. <clears throat> and that's important because persons need to see growth. And to them, that's how they measure the success of the CSO. They want to see growth. If you are, let's say, like for example, the TTA Saturday in 2012, and today we are in 2020, and we are in the same position we were in before. It has not evolved. There has been no changes and so forth. It means that persons may be inclined to believe that, no, 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 something is wrong there. Something is not happening how it should happen. You know, so make sure that your CSO is growing. And not only is it growing, but it is also delivering results. And I think that's one of the things the TTA has, has on its side in that when we meet despondent patients, we give them a sense of hope because quite often they tell us um, we are much hopeful now and we actually got new information. So it is important for you and the members of your executive to be aware and to be abreast of um, best practice and current research. Those two are marketing tips because when you find yourself in a position like the position I find myself in here this afternoon, <laughs> You have to be able to talk from the top of your head and simplify the information so that all can understand. And I think in a nutshell, that would be my uh, marketing, marketing, marketing tips for uh, CSOs. 
from my experience with ETTEA. So I'll stop here now and I'll open the floor for any questions. Um, I want to say something to you, mm -hmm. Mrs. Maxime. Mm -hmm. One of the questions I, uh, I had written down to ask you was, how do you measure success? But I smiled. I don't know if you saw me smiling when you were speaking. Mm -hmm. And I took note. You said that you measure success by growth, right? So mm -hmm. there was no time to ask you that question again. Mm -hmm. My other observation here in listening to you, I took quite a bit of notes, though. Mm -hmm. you know, it's good to you know compare because it's from a different perspective yet for all relevant, yeah? yeah? So another thing I took from you because I'm on the accounting side as well and I like the idea, I love the idea mm -hmm. when you said um, after the event you would have revised the way you do things and mm -hmm. you have created a form that would record your mm -hmm. activities so that in the future you can come back and report it and I just love that idea. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. You, you gave us a lot of food for thought here and to be honest with you, you explain this thing so simple. I don't think I have any questions for you. I need a rest of that question. I put Mr. Maxime in trouble next class. <laughs> Thank you so very much. But I may have some questions relating to um, TTEA mm -hmm. and, you know, as it relates to the woman and stuff like that. Because, yeah, I, I may be very, very interested in that. You'll find out more about that. So, okay. thank you. No problem. Um, All right. We'll actually share my contact with you. Yes. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yes. No Thank you so very much. Yeah, and I enjoyed I enjoy your presentation this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so good evening. Thank and you. I must say a wonderful presentation. Um I myself have become much more knowledgeable about uh I don't even sure if I could pronounce it, but what we spoke about. <laughs> What we spoke about, you spoke about this afternoon, uh, that specific um, CSO. Um, just out of curiosity, though, um, you mentioned that, you know, your organization provides a lot of hope for persons that, you know, come in with the disease and they're, you know, they're really hopeless and so forth. Mm -hmm. In regards to helping these set of patients to deal with loss or grief when probably a, a, a patient might have succumbed. Um, I don't want to ask, do we use any marketing there or do we, is marketing advisable in situations like this? And how does your organization deals with it? In terms of, uh, is, let me see if I understand you correctly. Miss um, Charles? Yes. Okay. Let's see if I understand you correctly. You were asking about in terms of grief and how the TTA, the TTEA deals with grief. Yeah. Well, with their patients that they would have lost or client that they would have lost. One. And uh, because one of the questions I have noted is how emotions, you know, how do you, is it okay to use marketing when uh, regarding people and when they suffer a high level of emotion, right? So that line, my question is coming from. So mm -hmm. how do your organization uh, deals with persons that are grieving? Because we speak about the fundraising, how you deal with that and so forth. So when you experience a loss of, you know, a client or someone that would have had the disease that was a part of your organization, how then do you your organization deals with it. Uh, is it seen also as a marketing strategy, the way that you deal with it? Or, and would you also recommend or give any indicators or not to um, dealing with or using these sort of opportunities to, to market an organization? I know that question sounds kind of harsh, but I'm just asking you. No, actually, it's a very good question. I think one of the things I should have said at the beginning in terms of loss, endometriosis is not necessary, it's not a benign disease. So it's not like cancer or lupus, so one of those where you would actually die from. Sorry, oh, okay. endometriosis is a benign disease. 
it's not one that you would die from. And I said, when I say benign, it's not terminal. Okay. Terminal. So our type, let's say our grief in the endometriosis world, we never had a case of it, but we have heard of cases in the, in the, in the, in the international community where persons would have uh, taken their lives because they cannot cope with the amount of pain because it is extremely painful. No. Yeah, and medical, and ask any, any medical uh, practitioner, any gynecologist, they're gonna tell you that endometriosis is one of the most painful diseases you will ever come across, right? In terms of marketing, marketing, uh, the manner in which we would deal with a loss or grief. In terms of loss, um, we have never had that situation before. Um, so we never had to treat with a situation like that. And I pray to God we don't. However, in terms of grief, when you talk about grief and that emotional uh, involvement as it pertains to the disease, we're talking about um, infertility. We're talking about pain. And uh, that is not something, to be quite honest, that is not something we would market. But indirectly it may be a marketing tip and why i say that is the man the way in which we would let's say treat with endometriosis we treat with it on different levels like we when we are having events now we have made attempts to have um quarterly membership meetings and have resource persons coming in. And one of the persons we would really want to come in or one of the persons that uh, should come in for a group of that nature will be, let's say, a social worker, a psychologist, because you are looking at women, some women, not all, and that's important. Some women who are grieving because they can't have children. They are being ridiculed for it. Those who have endometriosis and they may choose not to have children, they are stigmatized as, and so persons may think that they cannot have. And Apart from those issues, they may be dealing with issues within their personal, within their personal uh, circles, All right? Um, one of the things that actually works when we have, let's say, patient seminars would be that peer counseling. So you meet someone who has endometriosis and you have endometriosis and you start talking and right away you could relate to this person because you both have something in common the person is all non-judgmental they don't have an agenda they can relate to every single thing you are talking about well for the most part and they can also give you tips on how they are coping not just on the emotional side but on the physical side as well. So to answer your question, I would say it is not something we market. Um, and I would dread to think that we do. Uh, but indirectly, it can be used as a marketing tip. Marketing tip. Did I answer your question? Yes, more or less. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Any other any other questions? Comments? Well, I have one comment. Oh, sorry. oh Bonnie, sorry. Go ahead. I think Bonnie. Go ahead, Bonnie. Okay. All right. Thanks very much for the presentation. Totally enjoyable. And I have two questions as it relates to marketing. The first one is a basic one. In terms of biographies and profiles of, of, uh, of let's say, people in the organization, the way they are designed and put out. For example, I noticed a number of organizations, they do not list, they do not seem to list people's qualification in terms of academic qualifications, but just, uh, they might say they have, let's say, degrees in science and this and that. Is that a technique that organization uses, that organization use? Uh, whereas some others will say, uh, this stuff has a bachelor's in this and master's in this, whatever. Are, are those marketing tools? That's one. And two, in terms of exposing person's vulnerability, particularly in, in the case of your organization where, where by virtue of you being leading it, you, you tell people that there are, some, there are some medical issues with you. Is that also a marketing tool? Thank you, Bonnie. To answer your first question, if I understand it correctly, in terms of bios and um, your qualifications, um, it depends. And uh, what we, what the approach we use is, we leave it up to the person who is serving. So whatever you value, whatever you value, let's say you value, you work hard for your qualification and you think it should be stated, then that's all fine and good. We are going to post it. It's going to say something. Uh, but if you think that that is not important, then by all means, and you feel that, okay, you are currently serving on your church board, or you are currently involved in another nonprofit, or you are patient and you overcome, and you value that, then we value that also. Because they both have a place. Last year during, last year during um, March month, which is Awareness Month, uh, we had our first nurses seminar on endometriosis. And I mean, we really had, in terms of presenters, we had a really stellar lineup. It was really good. And everybody was commenting on the caliber of the presenters. And two of the presenters that actually hit me, that is our, well, she wasn't really a presenter, but she had to bring opening remarks. That's our former first lady, Mrs. Zaleha Hassan Ali. And in her biography, it is important to her that she states she is a mother, a grandmother, and a great grandmother. She is a Muslim. It is important to her that she stated that, right? That's one. Then another, uh, one of the presenters, um, Mrs. Um, I'm trying to remember her name. Do you remember her name? Landred Smith. No, not Landred Smith. Um, the uh, retired head nurse. Oh, yes. I, I haven't seen her now. I don't remember her name. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember her name. She was a former head nurse. In yeah, she, nurse. I mean, she was really high in nursing in Trinidad. She lectured in the nursing school. She also served in a regional capacity. And she's on top of her game. All right? And in her bio, she wrote that she is a wife and a mother. And you know what dawned on me 
in that seminar for endometriosis patients, how many endometriosis patients will not have the opportunity to write that they are a mother in dear bio? That is what actually dawned on me at that particular time. And to me, I didn't, when we, well, during the time I went to school, they wanted what they emphasize is your qualification and writing uh, your qualification in your resume. And they don't emphasize stuff like being married, Qualities. Uh, qualities in your bio. They don't emphasize that. But in truth and in fact, those were the two bios that impressed me the most. Because let's take our first lady, for example. She was a teacher and all that. But to her, that is not important. Right? And in the eyes of the Trinidad and Tobago public, that is also not important. What is important to them is her qualities. Right, so that's to answer your first question. I hope I did answer your first question. Um, your second question, what are, you, what are you gonna use the fact that you are a patient as part of the mind? The second to answer your second question, and that's a bit of a tricky one. Um, a lot of person who, a lot of persons who are into marketing, marketing, communications and PR. And I know quite a number of persons who are, because my qualifications are in communications, public relations and media, right? So they're gonna tell you to, it's important that you sell yourself as a patient. People, sell yourself is not the correct terminology. But what they're saying is that they, you need to share your experience because it becomes more relatable and real for the audience. And to an extent, yes, but it's a two-edged sword, right? There are some persons, if you have to speak with, let's say the medical professionals, and you cannot, you cannot run an organization of this nature without um, having a relationship with your medical professionals. It is not just about your experience. You also have to be extremely knowledgeable on the disease. And I'm not talking about uh, getting a license to practice medicine. We're not talking about that. We're talking about uh, being abreast of current research and best practice and being able to relate to the issues and break down the issues so that persons can understand. And for me, I guess I had I have quite a number on my end in terms of, well, one, I was okay. a teacher for 18 years. Uh -huh. yeah. The second thing is all my qualifications, well, most of my heavy qualifications are in uh, communications, media, and public relations. Um, did I answer your question, Vonnie? Right, I think you did, yes, thanks. No, I, I, one of the things that, that you mentioned, Bonnie, is if being a patient is an additional Philip, or if that helps more than anything else. It does in some Remember the organization to help those afflicted with or affected by, so that the membership of the, of the organization, not only the patients, not only the females, is about the people in their lives who have to take care of them, who have to, you have to have walked that road with them. And most of the times when we uh, marketing efforts always have that underlying tone, We're dealing with those afflicted with or affected by. So that, that's, how, that's, how we get men in the, that's how we get men in the association to start with. Because we are not going to be affected with, but we are affected by. Because we have friends, relatives, you know, colleagues who have disease. So that just being a patient is not enough. And I think that's what I'm saying. That, that, that's not enough. Because to be able to relate to the doctors, and so you have to know about the disease. <laughs> Listra? Listra, your phone is up. Listra. Are you going to ask a question? So, so, so that. Uh, uh, I can I leave that, there, please? Yeah, okay. yeah, that's a Sorry. Go ahead. And we, uh, he, for a second. Can we go back to Bonnie? 
Let's check you hold a minute. Just for one minute. Let's do you mind? So that what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing, although we cannot move in aside, what I'm hearing is that the afflicted is let's say the patient of course. Right. But the affected becomes the whole family and sometimes even a, a community and brother. So that the whole process is is not if you want to say do individual in a home, but it's a whole community. And it's a community conversation also. It is a community co uh, conversation and uh, it's a school issue as well. And we have a school program. And one of the reasons for the school program is because of the um, delay in diagnosis. You're looking at, at a 10 years delay. And usually, patients start exhibiting symptoms during their teenage years. But who right. knows? Some persons so in order to get to that patient, because remember, some patients, their quality of life is so reduced that they, they're basically confined to their homes. So you need to reach the persons who are within that patient circle so that they can carry the message for her. Yeah? But to, right. go, to go back to what you were saying in terms of if I market myself um, as a patient, to be quite honest with you, I really do. Yeah, to be direct, I don't. But persons will always ask, um, why are you involved? Right. And why, why would you found uh, a CSO with him here? And this is where it comes in. This is definitely where it comes in. So for some person, it might be a marketing tip. But for me, it's not. And uh, uh, as the association grows and the workload increase, you find yourself talking about your experience less because there are other persons who would want to share their experience and you would want them to do so. So in most of our, let's say in our um, seminars, there's always there's always a slot for personal experience and most of the time i would have to focus on something different so i would never get the opportunity to share my experience i would have shared my experience once now i did promise myself that as a fundraiser for the ttea because my experience was quite colorful extremely colorful so much so that when i went to dr lendo i think we know dr lendo right we all know right. dr. Lendo. But he, him, he said all i can say is that we are quite happy to have you with us now um i'm going to do a memoir and sell it so that persons can see read the experience how i cope with the experience and some things that you can do differently if you are a patient so that you can enjoy a better quality of life. Yeah? Excellent. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, Ms. Um, good night, Ms. Good night, Ms. Maxime. Good night. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. Thank you um, for giving us much needed knowledge. I, I want to compliment you on your presentation because it's something that Mr. Maxime would have said to us along the way in terms of it's so important that the members of the CSO understand what we're about. Um, it helps with us being able to sell and market. And I got that from you this afternoon because I'm ready to join the organization based on how <laughs> you know, you would have put across your, you know, what it's about and everything. In addition to that, um, I do have someone with endometriosis, my sister. 2016, I had to travel with her to have an operation in Trinidad. Dr. Perkins was our doctor there um, because Dr. Lendo is our doctor here and he would have recommended Dr. Perkins. And in addition to being expensive, it's a hassle 
Um, she still lost her in the, her in the endometriosis is back. And it's a difficult thing for not just her, but for the family to deal with, you know, looking at her going through the process. And I mean, her recommendations was to have a baby now and then have an hysterectomy. So it's hard, you know, that her reality is going to be that she either does it now or never do it at all. Um, so I understand what comes along with endometriosis. And um, I really hope that someday what Trinidad, Trinidad benefits from the, your group, Grenada can also have that. Because here she really doesn't have any support. There's no support groups or organization that looks out um, for people with that particular disease. I think you guys are doing a really great job. It's much needed for women. And, um, and thanks again for your presentation. I learned a lot and it just speaks to where we need to be as a CSO as we move forward and being able to sell our organization and convince people as to what we're about and how needed we will be. So thanks. Thank you for your comments, Ms. James. Um, if you would like to speak to me after about your sister, that's fine. There's actually a doctor in Trinidad that has a special interest in endometriosis. So I can share that information with you, uh, depending on her stage and the extent of the endometriosis. Um, he might be able to handle it. If it is too advanced for her, then there are those in the international community that I can share with you. Because in 2017, I had to travel to Atlanta to the Center for Endometriosis Care to, um, for surgery. And since then I'm doing extreme, extremely well. I mean, I had a few hiccups along the way because you're talking about, uh, it's over 20 something years I've been coping with it. I have had like about eight surgeries prior so it means that the doctor, it meant that the doctor had quite a lot of work to do, but he did his best and I'm enjoying the results. It's not perfect because there's only so much he can do after the disease has progressed to a certain stage, after you have had so many failed interventions. Um, but to summarize it, last day I probably took four sick days if so many. And I've come a long way. In terms of Grenada, we have been, we have been having discussions. And when I say we, I mean uh, my fellow Grenadian friends, colleagues, they have been encouraging me to have at least a seminar across here in Grenada. And I have been considering it, and I'm still considering it. And it's something we need to have because uh, patients are having the same complaints that patients that were having and are still having. Because while we are doing our part, at the end of the day, you have to go to the medical doctors for them to do their part. And if our medical doctors are not abreast of treatment, uh, the current research, the treatment approaches, and best practice, we are going to continue to have this problem. And whenever we have meetings, uh, persons, sometimes within a CSO, you can lose, the focus can slightly shift. And you as the executive, and for me so, the founder, it is extremely important that our mission and our vision is clear and is always in focus. So we can become the most popular CSO out. We can have the largest following, but if endometriosis patients are not enjoying a quality of life, if patients are still complaining, there's still that sense of despondency, then I have an issue. We have an issue and I am going to continue to raise that issue. So what we are doing now, last year, we would have started to engage our nurses. And so we would have held the first uh, 
nurses some known endometriosis we are we have what we call a special interest group endometriosis special interest group and that group is headed by uh, dr brian brady and that is uh their focus sorry will be the medical health professionals and to help prof health professionals uh um become abreast of the current research and best practice and so to offer more effective treatments for endometriosis patients uh, our aim was to have a medical seminar and we were working on that we were it's a process don't think it's something that you can have over, that can happen overnight because it can't you're looking at you, a non-medic, uh, having conversation with a medic, that's a non-starter, and this is where your medical professional comes in, and this is where the medical professional and you, the non-medical professional, are on the same page. So both of us, we are members of the uh, World Endometriosis Society, and three representatives from the Trinidad and Tobago Endometriosis Association. Um, that's Dr. Brady. He's the head of the special interest group. Um, the vice president who is a registered nurse, a licensed midwife. And she's uh, something in, head, she's and nurse. she's a district head nurse now. And myself, we were, attend, we were planning to attend the fourth World Congress on endometriosis in Shanghai this year, February this year. But I guess God had different plans because the COVID happened and then the plan derailed. We received a communication stating that it was deferred to, to September this year and the venue was moved to Dubai. After, let's, about April, we would have received a second communication stating that it has been deferred to 2021, February 2021. They are still keeping it in Dubai. And if the uh, corona crisis is not under control by then, then we are going to have a virtual, virtual meeting. Um, we were planning to approach some of our colleagues. He would approach his medical colleagues because you need someone at their level to communicate with them. And I would approach some of my colleagues. These are, are persons who are involved in uh, foundations, associations, and so forth. And from there, we were going to plan the first medical seminar, but we are stuck here now. In order for us to plan that medical seminar, it means that we need to attend that 14 Congress on endometriosis first, because we need to bring uh, persons from the outside, professionals from the international endometriosis community to come and be the presenters for our medical or health professionals so that they, can, they, they will be better able or more accepting of that information. So basically, that is our strategy. Any other questions, comments? Um, you didn't talk about all the merchandising that TTA has. I mean, you know, lovely cups like these that only the president has and the assistant secretary doesn't have one. Um, all kinds of. Well, Mr. Maxime, you could do the class, the, um, you know, a favor and get us some gifts, you know? Yeah, well, <laughs> Since yeah. you have, you know, inside um, connections. And the assistant secretary doesn't have one. What does that tell you? How much rank do you think I have in the. <laughs> it tells me you can't spend much money on those marketing tools there, you know? Because resources are always limited. Limited, that's right. That's what it tells me, yeah. 
in colloquial terms, they're always looking for money. So ah. you have to put the money where you will get the maximum out of it. You can and the good thing about it, he can always share, you know, and that is good. Yeah. But um in terms I have to see if I have any um bookmarks, not brochures, bookmarks. Because we did bookmarks for schools. And I'll share, I'll give him to share with some of you. I don't know how many I have. So he will have to decide who he's giving yeah, or who yeah. he's not giving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Depending I, on the number. I have my people in mind already, I know. I know. So let's not even go. Thank you very much. It'll be greatly appreciated. <laughs> You're most yeah. welcome. I Thank you, Mr. Okay. Maximia. Ms. Maximia, I'll be waiting on my bookmarker. Just sure. Sorry. Oh, so sorry. I'm here. There's a message in the chat. Listra? So I think Listra wanted to say something earlier on here. Yeah. Sorry yeah, about that. We went back to body and, and, and we never left. Sorry, Listra. Are you still on? No, I'm not seeing her. Not seeing her. No. There was a message in the chat. Um, I like um, I like and I told us I didn't have to say more, but I like the fact that you know you mentioned credibility, yeah. accountability. Um, trust me, this I mean I could have just relate this to everything I heard Mr. Maxime say, and um, I also heard you spoke about the the group itself, the the this the president, the, the committee, mm -hmm. the um, the executive, mm -hmm. and the qualities they should display and stuff that should be done as an executive in terms of creating that and strengthening that CSO. So I took quite a bit. And, set quite a bit of notes. and that's important to set the tone. Because yes. you, that's another marketing tip as well. When you are dealing with different personalities, you can have clashes. And if you are not professional enough, it means things can escalate out of control. The situation can escalate out of control. So it is really important that you set the tone. I mean, in your mind, you might be cussing here, yeah, but you don't curse anybody because, I mean, at the end of the day, everybody has feelings. Everyone would have different perspectives, and those ex perspectives would have been shaped by their experiences. You know, and uh, your reasons, you provide solid reasons for doing what you do. Thank you, thank you. Um, if it's to give you another practical example, uh, one of the, remember I mentioned that we are separating the executive from the, from the board? Yes, I heard that distinctively. Yes. And yes. that is one of the reasons I in particular, I would have denied or turned down a particular opportunity. And I understand why there's a, it is a specific need. And I took it from my background of when you do accounting, you don't try to be the auditor as well. There is no way that goes hand in hand. You have to have somebody that is independent. So mm -hmm. that is the, the, the perspective I took it from. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we were looking, we were considering someone to be the chair of the executive. And there are other persons who are more active, you know, you know, that kind of thing. There are persons who would be very involved and very quiet. And you always have to listen to feedback when you have events and stuff, always. And persons would come up to you and they would tell you different things about different persons. And for me, the qualification was important. The, the um, involvement was important. But what was also important, what was extremely important for me, and that was the, 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 um, the decision-making factor, was her qualities. And that is how I recommended that person to the meeting, and everybody in the meeting agreed, you know, to appoint that person in the position. So to qualities, it tend to be undervalued in today's society, but Qualities are extremely, extremely, extremely important. Extremely important. Is Miss Radea or is she? Miss, 
I don't think Lister Lister, there, I think Lister, Lister probably got bumped off or had to leave. Well, do extend my apologies to her. Yeah, I will, I will. And I will, I will take the question for you. Yes. Yeah. I will also share um, contact information on the WhatsApp chat afterwards. Okay. All right. And the, the recording will be posted mm -hmm. on the chat as well. I also like the part that you said about maintaining relationship with all of your stakeholders as much as you can because you'll try to reach all of them. And it is important because um, you they need to know that you appreciate whatever it is they're doing. And it's good to touch base, not just when you want to have some funding, but also to tell them thank you at the end of such events. So am I speaking from your book, sir? Yes. At the end of such events. <laughs> and also to, um, to, to make them understand that they're not just there because you need them for the financial assistance, but they're there because you consider them. So I understand that very much. And that was some of my tactics used in my sales and marketing strategy for many years. Yeah, so I can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody needs to feel appreciated. Mm -hmm. So no other questions? So that's just, it for me? No, no, no. Hold on, hold on. Let me just find out. Any other Questions, comments, before we close off? Um, sir, permission, please. I, I need to leave now because I have another meeting. So on my way out, Miss Maxime, I would like to say thank you very much. I really did learn a lot. And a lot of the principles that you brought forward and all of the tips, well, now I know who learned from who. So yeah. I know that so learned from you. So, as I go, have a pleasant evening, everybody. Very true. Very true. <laughs> Thank you very much, Miss Jazz. And you have it correct. I know that. Yeah, <laughs> just, just remember, you play with your grade, you know? <laughs> Don't worry. I'm taking a G from you any day of the week. <laughs> this, this, this but from day this one, nine to F, so it's all right. Play this great threat's not going to work. We're going to have to put me. This is Maxime on your case as it relates to this threat because of the grades. It's well, not working anymore. <laughs> We're getting a WhatsApp number. Remember that, yeah? <laughs> Miss Maxime, so I can this much. You know, some people are looking for um, doubles, I think. So, I mean, <laughs> it's not to do with the G or any of the doubles, you know? Alupai. <laughs> Alupai. That's right. Alupai. So, so, at the end of the, um, when, is, when does this semester come by then? In July, from then on. So he would have a treat for you. He would treat everyone with aloe pie. Yeah, but we have to be socially. Uh -huh. Thank you, thank you. Wow. We're happy. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> you can watch me eat it here, but you know. <laughs> Social distancing, sir. We will have a virtual party. We we'll have a virtual party. You want to watch? <laughs> you want? <laughs> so no, no more, no more questions. Just stick it, stick it around. We're gonna, gonna close off. We're gonna close mm -hmm. off now. So if there are no further questions, I will thank Abisha on your behalf and um, and disregard everything she told you about who taught who. You know, I mean, that's not that's not good on that road at all. Because you know, we know we know how this executive runs. We know who is the president and who is the vice president. So all I have to say is that I have asked permission to say that. <laughs> So we close off. We close off for now. Um, I will post the recording for those for people like uh, Karen, uh, Kevin, sorry, who had to you know had to officiate in other places. And I thank you all as usual. I enjoyed myself. Thank you for participating. Have a good evening. Thank Bye, you guys. for having me. Thank you for. You're welcome. Thank you. It was a thank pleasure. You. Thank you. And don't uh, forget, I, I, I have a question. It's right, it's off the chat. Okay, all right, yeah. no problem. <laughs> Linda. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.